we will end our information session talking about other considerations or helpful pieces of information for FAFSA completion. If an independent student is married, your spouse is considered a contributor as well. They are going to need to consent to transfer their federal tax information from the IRS, requiring them to have an FSA ID and password. If the spouse does not provide consent, the student's FAFSA will not be processed and the student will not be eligible for federal financial aid. This goes for any contributor as identified by the FAFSA. Examples of individuals who may need to provide consent are students, student spouses, parents, and their spouses. Other questions that we are frequently asked are who is included in family size? For a dependent filer, they need to count themselves, the student, the parent, and their parent's spouse, and the parent's other dependent children, even if these children live apart from the parent because of school enrollment. They may also count other people who may live with the parent, that the parent provides more than 50% of the monetary support for and can also be included in the household size. For independent filers, they will include themselves, the student, their spouse, the student's dependent children, even if they live apart from the student because of school enrollment, and other people that may live with the student, who the student can show that they provide more than 50% of the financial support for in that FAFSA year. A change from prior FAFSAs is that an unborn child can no longer be considered in the family size. Previously, this was allowed to be considered in the family size based on the expected due date. After the contributors and the student have completed all of their information and provided consent of their tax information to be transferred and signed and submitted the FAFSA, what happens next? That FAFSA information gets sent to a federal processing system. The federal processing system sends the results of that information to the student and the schools listed on the FAFSA form. These results include the student's SAI, messages related to conflicting information, and the student's eligibility for federal financial aid funds. The school receives this information electronically in a document called the Institutional Student Information Record, or ICER. The student will receive an electronic copy of their FAFSA submission summary. Your FAFSA submission summary will contain four sections. Those sections include an eligibility overview and summary of the answers that you submitted on the FAFSA form. It will also include the college or university information that was submitted by the student. Finally, it will provide the student with potential next steps that may need to be taken. This FAFSA submission summary can be printed and kept for your records. The federal processing system will then send the results of each student's FAFSA information to the schools the student has identified. The school may request additional documentation as needed. We call this process verification. If necessary, corrections to the FAFSA data may be made. These corrections may be made by the student 
or parent logging in to the FAFSA and making corrections on the online form. They may also be made by submitting documentation to your college or university's financial aid office. Students may review their online FAFSA responses and start corrections in the FAFSA summaries submissions section of the online FAFSA. Please remember that you are using prior, prior year tax information. So for the 2024-2025 FAFSA, you will use your federal 2022 tax return information. We know that there can be life changes between the tax year used for the FAFSA form and present life. When these changes are significant, we call them special circumstances. These special circumstances are different than unusual circumstances or dependency overrides, which we discussed earlier. When unique conditions exist that cannot be documented within the FAFSA or circumstances have changed since filing the FAFSA, the student should contact the financial aid office at their college or university for additional instructions on how to have their special circumstances reviewed. The financial aid administrator has the ability to make decisions about the student's situation and make adjustments to the student's FAFSA data as appropriate. Please note that there may be requests for additional documentation to demonstrate the change in the student's circumstances. Decisions made by the financial aid administrator are final and cannot be appealed to the U.S. Department of Education. Examples of some of these special circumstances may include, but are not limited to, unusual medical bills not covered by insurance, unusual dependent care expenses, a parental or spousal death, change in employment status, including a loss of employment or reduction in wages and changes in a student's or parent's marital status. I would like to conclude our presentation today by thanking you for watching and listening to this valuable information. I know financial aid can be stressful and confusing in the best of times. The 2024-2025 school year is proving to be off to a very interesting start. The FAFSA simplification process, while beneficial for students, has given schools a few hiccups along the way. As a financial aid administrator, we do our best to make sure that the information we are delivering to you is the most current information we have access to. I believe at the time of the recording of this presentation that the information presented is as true and accurate as is available to us today. Thank you to NASFA, the National Association of School Financial Aid Administrators for providing us this information and to help colleges and universities educate students and families. And to Minnesota West Community and Technical College for sharing their resources in the making of this video. Please do not hesitate to reach out with questions or for assistance as you navigate your financial aid journey.